Well, thank you for having me today. I'm pleased to speak at the Emma Kwan Science Symposium. I was down to Emma Kwan last fall and Thurk Kildston last fall for the first time, and I got to know the landscape a little bit. And I think uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, or I hope it's going to be very relevant to some of the issues um, that you are dealing with in terms of invasive species in your region of Illinois. So my name is John Simpson. I'm the executive director of the Winus Point Marsh Conservancy. The Marsh Conservancy is a small wetlands and waterfowl research and conservation foundation in, o in northern Ohio. Um, we own and manage 3,000 acres of coastal marshes, which uh, you know makes invasive plant management part of our day-to-day -day job uh, and is, makes this very relevant to the discussion we're having today. I'm also a steering committee member on the Lake Erie Cooperative Weed Management Area. The CWMA is a community partnership uh, program that's focused on delivering invasive species management in our region. And that's gonna be the, a good chunk of what I talk about today. So just for a little orientation, um, you can see on the inset map there that we work within a four county area in North Central Ohio on the Southwestern shore of Lake Erie. This four county area of Ohio contains about 20,000 acres of coastal marsh, which is almost all of the remaining coastal marsh in Ohio. And those marshes are under a variety of ownerships, federal wildlife refuges, state wildlife areas, and then a significant amount of this marshland is under private ownership in the hands of duck hunting clubs, local duck hunting clubs. Um, and those clubs have been kind of key partners in, in some of our success. So like most of the coastal marshes in Lake Erie, on all sides of Lake Erie, invasive plants are a major issue, in particular Phragmites. This is some Phragmites mapping data that was done by helicopter by the Ohio Division of Wildlife in 2010. And you can see that our four county area at that time contained at least 4,000 acres of living Phragmites. And this is after we had already done one year of control. In 2008, 2009, um, in our area, the Phragmites had gotten so unmanageable that local marsh owners, both government and private low marsh owners, could no longer handle it on their own in their own silos. It had gotten to the point where, where we needed to partner together and deliver something larger at scale. Um, also important was the fact that the Phragmites was getting to the point that it was detrimental to the business operations of the local duck hunting clubs. Um, and this is important. It took, it took this, sort of, uh, this sort of issue to, to make Phragmites a recognizable issue for the clubs and really get people invested in invasive plant management. So in 2009, our local duck hunting clubs partnered with uh, the, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service private lands biologist to establish a grassroots Phragmites initiative in our area. And this really was just a, a back of the napkin pooling of financial and logistical resources um, to do everything we needed to do to get a helicopter up here in our region to spray Phragmites and start helping us manage this issue. It was extremely successful. We had great participation. We also had great management success with our herbicide application. And so in 2010, our group invited a few more partners in uh, and formally organized a cooperative weed management area, which is what I'm going to talk about in the first part of my presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm also going to talk a little bit about Phragmites in particular and some of the stand level sort of best management practices that we learned for Phragmites through, the, through our program. So cooperative weed management areas are partnership organizations that are formed with the goal of managing invasive plants at scale across the landscape. And there's sort of five defining characteristics of these CWMAs, characteristics that are important to consider when you're setting up CWMAs, and characteristics that I think are very important to the success of CWMAs, certainly ours. And so what I want to do is step through each one of those and discuss how we um, how we handled each one of those in, in our individual case and how I think that has helped our success. So the first characteristic is working within a defined geographic area. I already mentioned we combine our efforts to the four counties that contain most of the coastal marshes in Ohio, but then within those four counties, we developed a prioritization matrix to really focus in uh, our limited dollars and our limited efforts to where we think we might get the best bang for our buck. So this prioritization matrix, we can con consider each landowner or each tract 
based on the size of the, the wetland, the size of the invasive problem, um, the proximity to the coast and to other coastal wetlands, and then the management capabilities of that site. Both the, both the ability of us to conduct our upfront management, herbicide, water, and fire, but then uh, also the, the ability of the landowner to, to conduct follow-up maintenance over the next few years to maintain our initial treatments. It's also important if you want to enact invasive, you know, if you want to impact invasive plants at scale, it's also important to uh, capture the diversity of ownership across the landscape. So I already mentioned we work with our local waterfowl hunting clubs, but we also work with other private marsh owners, agricultural producers, corporate landowners, municipal, state, and federal government agencies, and then other nonprofits that own and manage wetlands as well. We have a steering committee that, that makes decisions and guides our program uh, along the way. The steering committee members, their role is to identify opportunities, prioritize efforts, and then guide program decisions and delivery. So each steering committee member brings something different to the table. And this is important because they can all bring something different. And when we pull it together, we can accomplish much more together than we can in our own silos. So for example, our large nonprofits that are on our steering committee have been have the resources to, to access and administer large grants. Um, our small nonprofits have the local connections to help get those, those grant dollars onto the ground and, and to where, where we need to work on the landscape. Our state and federal partners have access to different funding resources, perhaps, than what our nonprofits do. Um, and they also have the private lands staff that works with, with many of our landowners and, and can really drum up participation in the program. And then our local soil and water office uh, has a ton of connections to private landowners and agricultural producers, but also does all of our financial administration. And so when we pool all those together, it makes us much more successful as a committee. We have a long-term commitment to cooperation and a formalized partnership agreement. So, that, so we have a five-page organization plan that outlines our mission and vision. It talks about who the steering committee members are and what their roles should be. Um, we have a memorandum of understanding in there that we're all committed to a long-term program here. Um, it outlines financial administration and financial roles, which is important, very important. Um, and then it also outlines the board positions and roles. And this plan has really helped guide and direct um, and keep us on track in terms of making this program successful. And then lastly, we also have a strategic plan for addressing species of concern. And so you can see one page of our management plan there, and I'm not going to go through all the details of that, but suffice to say, it sets out our goals and objectives. It discusses things like integrated pest management, early detection and rapid response. Uh, the need for public education and program buy-in. It identifies our target species, talks about mapping those and, and, and um, um, delineating those. And then it also discusses how to seek and fund for, seek and identify funding opportunities. So adopting this CWMA model has been tremendously successful for us and at a landscape scale. You can see that from 2009 through 2016, we conducted nearly 10,000 acres of Phragmites management across our four county area. Since 2009, the program has grown from that initial grassroots Phragmites spraying contract to a multi-species invasive management program that involves monitoring, surveying, public education, and continued management. We also have an active equipment loan program now to support landowners' actions on their own. We employ a part-time coordinator um, who really oversees or, or offers landowner assistance and oversees the day-to-day -day management. Uh, we've had millions of dollars in funding that's come from grants, landowner matches, and donation and we've just recently secured a, a few grants that will give us at least a thousand acres of management capacity through the next two or three years we've also been successful at, at achieving that landscape level change or that landscape scape level invasive plant management which was our outset goal and i believe i firmly believe that our community partnership program is what helped us do that. So you can see that same 2010 helicopter survey mapping effort that mapped 4,000 acres of Phragmites in 2010. 
And then just by 2014, we were already down to about a thousand acres of Phragmites. So a visible scale across the, or a visible change across the landscape. But this success hasn't come without challenges either. As you can see, but when you look at that graph again, you can also see that from 2017 to 2021, we really didn't accomplish a whole lot in terms of on the ground management. And this was related to a few key things that, that um, we learned along the way. The first is that management successes are directly related to the steering committee investment of time and energy, but time and energy is limited. So, when, when we had an ambitious and active steering committee in the first few years, we accomplished a lot. Um, but, but when other things came up and people got distracted um, or just their time got consumed elsewhere, it quickly became apparent that we needed a dedicated and qualified coordinator to administer our program. And so we've recently brought on uh, a coordinator that's helped sort of get things up and rolling again there since 2022. Um, the other thing that happened in that period of time when we didn't accomplish quite so much on the ground management was that being so successful early kind of eliminated the problem. You know, we, we controlled so much Phragmites that, that we almost ran out of Phragmites to spray. And this is a good problem to have, um, but it, it's not very sustainable in the long term. So one important thing we identified was that education on the other in, invasive species that out there that maybe aren't quite such visible problems is still important to keep landowners engaged in wanting to manage those. And then, of course, long term management on sites is key, you know, both for long for management and for program success. Once you get over that big hump, you still want to continue to do those long that long term management. And then lastly, landowner participation and landowner investment in the program is important. And when I say investment, I mean they need to be invested in managing invasive species for all the right reasons. They also need to be financially invested in the program so that they're incentivized to maintain our actions into the future. And so uh, our, our, our program delivery decision matrix that I talked about also decides the level of cost share that landowners are gonna receive. So, so we have cost share levels from zero to 100%. And typically most landowners are paying between 25 and 50% of the management cost. Um, this defers some of our grant writing needs, of course, but this also invests those landowners into the long term uh, or long term maintenance uh, of our management actions. So I don't think I need to explain what Phragmites is to this audience, but as I transition in here to talking about some of the stand level management action um, stuff that we learned, um, I do want to highlight on my last bullet there. And I think this is a, an important note. And that at least from what I've found, Phragmites is much more manageable than many of the other invasive species that we have. And, th and this, is, this is helpful and this is something to keep in mind as we move forward. So in the early years, we experimented with uh, several different herbicide-based management techniques. Um, we experimented around the type of herbicide we were applying, the timing of that application, and then post-application follow-up actions. Um, and we set up a whole network of monitoring plots and monitored those, those plots for a bunch of years um, to sort of evaluate these, these different um, experimental treatments, if you will. Um, and this is the recipe on this slide that we came up with rather quickly, and this is what we've stuck with uh, ever since. And this is, uh, I believe, a very successful recipe for success in managing large-scale Phragmites stands. So what we typically do, or what we almost always do, is a fall herbicide treatment. So we've, we've applied herbicide from August all the way through the end of October. Typically, we're looking at that late September window in our part of Ohio when we're applying herbicide onto the Phragmites. Um, we use only glyphosate. We've tried other herbicides um, and glyphosate gives us great results and it's also cost effective, which is, which is another big bonus. Um, so we do that fall treatment and then we found that in the spring, thatch removal efforts uh, can really, really improve long-term success rates. And when I said, when we tried, we tried crushing, we tried mowing, but really what I'm talking about is a controlled burn. The only thing that I've seen that acts uh, that 
functions almost as well as a controlled burn is if you get a lot of ice and water scouring over the winter that removes that dead biomass. So what we do is spray in late September and then the following spring or early summer we, we return, run a controlled fire through that stand, remove all the dead biomass, and really what's important is we're exposing that, that soil that's underneath that dead biomass. If the capabilities are there, in a managed situation, some shallow flooding can help after that controlled burn to, to um, generate some, some perennial vegetation, but it's not necessary. But what is necessary is follow-up treatments. Once you get by that over that first big initial hump of uh, herbicide application, it's really important to conduct follow-up treatments and stay on top of that. So here's some management um, or here's some monitoring plot data that really outlines what I'm talking about in terms of uh, the importance of fire in long-term control. So there's four treatment types across the bottom um, that we monitored from 2000, 2011 through 2017. On the left, on the y-axis, is percent cover of Phragmites, living Phragmites within those treatment plots. And I'll just kind of walk you through each, each treatment and, and explain what I'm talking about. You can see the first treatment on the left there is herbicide alone. So all these treatment plots received um, herbicide application in 2011 and then follow-up treatments in 2012, 2013, and 2014 uh, to, to treat a little follow-up or, you know, treat re-sprouts and, and stuff that was missed the prior years. And in the case of this herbicide plot, then after 2014, we just walked away and left that plot to mother nature and you can see that by 2017 we were almost back to a full stand uh, of frag no different than when we had started our treatments the middle two plots the first one is herbicide in the fall and the same thing uh, 20,000 2011 uh, a large-scale treatment and then uh, follow-up treatments in the next several years um, but that included a, a controlled burn the following spring after that 2011 fall herbicide treatment. And you can see that the long-term control all the way through, to, through 2017 that we got was much better than the herbicide and walk-away treatment. The next treatment included some seeding on that burn. It didn't make much of a difference, but we still got that long-term control. The last treatment was herbicide, and then instead of a burn, we tried mowing and crushing that Phragmites, which helped. Um, because it did expose a little bit of soil, but really we didn't get the long-term control with that. So take-home message is that you can see there in the middle, the burn really gave us that long-term control. And I think a lot of that is related to species richness. So that fire exposed a lot of soil, and on sites that, that included a fire treatment the following spring, we had about 230% increase in species richness. Where on the, the sites that did not include a fire treatment, we had about a 95% increase in species diversity. And just speaking anecdotally, what I think happened was that on those non-fire treatments, um, if we did get any plant species coming back, there were just a lot of annual weeds, if you will, that didn't do a very good job of out-competing the remaining Phragmites and the re Phragmites re-sprouts. But the burn sites produce so much more plant diversity that this diverse community and this diverse community that can, included a lot of perennial vegetation was a lot more competitive and able to, you know, basically outcompete the Phragmites that was trying to recolonize into the long term. So I'm pretty much right exactly out of time, um, and I will just leave this slide up as I answer questions at the end here. Um, these are resources, I think great resources, um, for a lot of what I talked about. The Midwest Invasive Plant Network has resources on setting up CWMAs and also on um, invasive plant management. Um, the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health is a great guidebook for uh, CWMA establishment. The Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative is probably the best Phragmites management clearinghouse that I know of. And then I'll put my contact information up there too, because I'm happy to answer questions from anyone um, that may be interested in, in picking my brain a little bit more.